So it, it is a pleasure now to introduce the, one of the keynote speakers of the conference and is Peter Johnston uh, from the University of Cambridge, who will give a talk entitled Development of the Notion of Classifying Topos. Thank you. Um, and thank you very much to the organizers and in particular to the scientific committee for inviting me to give a talk at this meeting. So I thought it would be interesting not to present any new research because I haven't got any new research to present, uh, but to give you a talk on an aspect of the history of the subject that I've been involved in for a lot of my career. Um, because as May, May remarked yesterday in her talk, it's, it's so good to see so many young people at this meeting. Um, but it does mean that the collective memory of what happened, and I'm talking about events that happened nearly 50 years ago, is fading. And, you know, this is a story that is not written down in a coherent fashion anywhere, as far as I know, or at least it is now written down in my paper, but uh, until then it wasn't. Um, I have been fortunate that I was present at many of the meetings where key developments took place in this story. And, uh, you know, those of us who remember those meetings are dwindling in number. We won't be here forever. So I thought it would be a nice opportunity to, to set down the story of how the concept of classifying topos, as we now know it, developed and how the different constructions um, sort of coalesced into an understanding of how they work. And if I have a bit of time at the end, I will say something about a result that Olivia Caramello is very fond of, called the, which he calls the duality theorem, because it is related to this subject. And I want to try and place it in the context of this overall historical development. Okay, so where do classifying toposes come from? Well, the, the, the phrase classifying topos, or rather in French, topo classifiant, occurs for the first time in SGA4, as you would expect. Um, and it's there as one of their very first examples of a topos. And it, what it means is just the topos of sets with a G action, where G is a discrete group. And they were aware, I mean, it doesn't occur actually in that particular reference, but later on in SGA4, expose 4, they prove this result that this is a representing object for G torsors, which in turn represent one dimensional cohomology classes in toposes, that to say, geometric morphisms from E into G sets correspond up to isomorphism to one dimensional, to element of H1 of E with coefficients in G. So this is an analog of the idea of the classifying space of a group as being something that represents one dimensional cohomology with coefficients in the group. And that, of course, is where the term came from. Um, now, in addition to looking at just actions of a discrete group, um, oh, as I said, it, it, the phenomenology is borrowed from algebraic topology, but there is a difference. Um, in algebraic topology, there is a well-developed notion of classifying space, or there was already by that time a well-developed notion of classifying space. Uh, there was Ed Brown's representability theorem, which tells you precisely which functors are representable. Uh, well, not on the homotopy category of spaces, you have to go to the stable homotopy category, that they are all possible generalized cohomology theories in all dimensions. And that is exactly what you get. So there was a general theory there. Here, there was just this isolated example, really. Um, obviously, there, was, there must have been some hope that one might build a general theory about which functors on top of this were representable, but they didn't actually go very far with that. They did do a little bit more. Um, they observed, really just as examples of top bosses, that if you take an internal group in a top boss E, then the top boss of G object in E is itself a top boss. And they also looked at continuous actions, at least of a profinite group. And they used the same term, topo classifier, on the same notation, B sub G for those, but they didn't see them as actually representing particular sorts of functors. Um, so this was just really an isolated example. Okay, so the next development, I think, is due to Jean Giraud, who wrote a book on non-abelian cohomology published in 1971. And he also looked at 
topos of, of actions of an internal group, and he did prove the result that they correspond to torsos in topos is defined over E. Um, so, so he had that result, but this was a representing object for cohomology now as a function, not just on top, but on topos is over a particular topos E. And, you know, talk that he gave in a conference at Dalhousie in 1971, uh, and it was written up in Schwinger Lecture Notes 274. He actually extended this to topos to form uh, precedes or, or covariant functors on C for C an internal category in E. Well, except he didn't really, um, because he didn't have the concept of internal category, or at least it doesn't appear in that paper. He, he referred everything down to the underlying site and worked with stacks over the underlying site. And that, you know, it, it's very hard to see what he was actually doing in that paper. I've, I've read it many times, and I'm, you know, it, it, it's a, it's an excellent example of how to hide a simple truth in a very complicated language. Um, uh, and the other thing is, again, you know, this was just a well, a, a slightly less isolated example than uh, than groups for these doing arbitrary categories. But there was no attempt to consider in general what sort of categorical functors on toposes over E might occur as might, might actually be representable by top of, by particular toposes over E. Um, so as I say, this this was not part of a general theory, it was just a, an isolated result. Okay, then the next person we have to talk about is Monique Hakim. Uh, and she wrote a book called Topo Analé et Schema Relatif, Wing Toposes and Relative Schemes, published in 1972. Um, and that was actually an expanded version of a PhD thesis. And if you look in the Mathematics Genealogy Project, you'll find the date of her thesis is quoted as 1972, but actually it was a bit early, it was 67. At least I believe that date is correct. Um, and that, that book is often cited as the true origin of the notion of classifying topos, in particular, Hock and Reyes in their chapter in the Handbook of Mathematical Logic, 1972, give, give her credit as having invented the notion, and so does Olivia Caranello in her book more recently. Um, and yes, I mean, she does construct particular examples of classifying toposes. Uh, so she does the classifying topos for rings as precies on the opposite of finite presented rings, and then she imposes the appropriate broken topologies on that to get classifying toposes for local rings and for strictly local rings. So you take the Zerbisky topology or the Etal topology on finite presented rings op, you get those, you get classifiers for those, and she proves those results. And not only that, but she also does some relativization. She talks about spectra, which we heard about in the talk earlier today. Um, so the spectrum of ring topos, that represents a certain functor on toposes over E, um, namely it represents localizations of the ring A in topos is defined over E. So when you have a topos F over E, you lift the ring A into F and then you pick a localization of it in there. So, so that was in fact the main result of her thesis that you could, you, you could construct a topos that classified the notion of localization of a given ring in, a, in an arbitrary topos, or at least an arbitrary broken deep topos. Oh, but once again, um, you know, this, these were just, particular examples. She didn't attempt to describe a general theory of which they were examples. Um, she, uh, so no, no sense of what sort of functors on top over E might be representable. And the other thing is she didn't actually use the term top of classifion. It never appears in the book. Okay, so that, as I say, is, is considered by some people as the true origin of classifying toposes. I would rather go to Gonzalo Reyes who I think was the first person who really realized that there was a general theory there to be exposed. Um, so he saw that at least if you restrict the coherent toposes, you can represent, you can think of them as representing objects for the appropriate kind of logical theories, namely coherent theories, um, as functors on the dual of toposes over, over sets. Um, and he had a Master student called Jean Dion in 1972 to 73, uh, and he persuaded him to work out the details of how to turn the syntax of a 
coherent theory into a category and then Reyes himself observed that if you take that category and, and put the appropriate coverage on it, you get a site whose topos of sheaves contains what we now think of as a generic model of the theory. So this says that arbitrary coherent theories have generic models and uh, conversely, every coherent theory, uh, every coherent topos is, is actually presentable as the, the, the classifying topos of a coherent theory. Incidentally, uh, Dion seems to have been a, a clever guy, but he didn't stay in category theory, unfortunately. I looked him up on, on the web and I, I gather he had what seems to have been quite a distinguished career in mathematics education, but he never did anything else in categories. Um, so uh, this is where I come into the story. Um, so I got, I, I got to hear about this very soon after it, it happened. Um, the first international conference I ever went to was the open house that Thomas Clark organized at Aarhus in May 73. And Bill Dorvier came to that, having just been in Montreal immediately beforehand and heard about uh, the work of Reyes and Dion. And so he devoted his lectures at that open house to describing the, the notion, this notion of classifying topos. Uh, as I said, he, he introduced some, he tweaked it a bit with, with ideas of his own, but he made it clear that this was basically reporting on what Reyes and Dion had already done. Um, so I got to hear about that very early. And uh, of course, two months later, Bill gave an invited talk at the uh, European Logic Colloquium in Bristol, uh, in which he repeated that material, and that, that got written up. Of course, his, his Aarhus lectures were never written up, although I, have my, I still have my own notes of them. Um, so that, uh, that talk was probably the first place where uh, the Reyes Dion construction of classifying topos is found its way into print in 1975. Um, and now we have to look at a rather different development. So uh, this begins with the work of Radu Diakonescu, who was a student of Miles Tierney. And uh, he was among the people who attended that Dalhousie Conference 71, where Euro presented his paper on classifying toposes. Um, and either he or Tierney, I'm not sure which, realized that there had to be a simpler way of doing what Giro was trying to do in that paper. And so Radu went away and did it in his PhD thesis, uh, which was submitted in 73, but the main result was known to everybody by the, to the experts by 72. And so he, he showed that if you, uh, you know, if you work in terms of internal categories, you get a very nice explicit presentation of what the geometric morphisms over E into a top of the form C E correspond to, they correspond to flat functors on, on the dual of C. Um, and so that result, as I say, became known um, to the experts, certainly by middle of 72. And in and Gavin Wraith picked up that idea, and he he worked out how you could build in any topos with a natural number object, you could build an internal category whose objects were, in some sense, the finite sets in that top or the finite cardinals. And that if you take that as your underlying category, um, you then get a classifier for the theory of object, let's say a representing object for the forgetful functor from top over E to cat, which sends a top off to its underlying category and a geometric morphism to its inverse image functor. Um, so Gavin, was also at Aarhus in 73, May 73, and he spoke about that. And by the way, many of you will know that uh, I keep a diary whenever I'm traveling away from home. I've got my current diary here. This is volume 98 of a series that started in 1971. And I looked up my diaries from 1973, and I described the Kevin's talk as the most interesting thing I'd heard in Aarhus so far, which means I rated above Bill Lovier's lectures, which surprises me now, um, but I think I know why. It was because I could see uh, that what Gavin had done, you know, it, it left open certain, certain avenues that I could explore. And you know, I was still at that stage of research, you know, looking for things to put in my thesis. I thought, yes, I can go away and do that. Um, anyway, uh, whoops, uh, yeah, um, so, uh, 
Gavin also went on to the main summer meeting that year in Amiens, which I didn't attend, and he spoke about the result again there. And then in September of 73, uh, Ronnie Brown arranged a little workshop in Bangor, at which Gavin gave a course of lectures on elementary toposes. And there was, there was time for some invited talks. And by then I'd worked out how to take race method and extend it to build a classifying topos for an arbitrary, at least a finitely presented algebraic theory over any base of natural number object. And I spoke about that in Bangor and that talk got written up and published in Springer Lecture Notes 445 in 1975. And of course it also went into my thesis. Okay. So now we come to the Reyes Mackay book. And according to the introduction, uh, Reyes and Mihai Mackay started collaborating on the idea of a book on first order model theory and category theory in early 74. Um, uh, the book didn't get published till 77, uh, but they spoke about their results in, at the Oberwolfach meeting in summer 74, and those summaries got published in Bulletin of the Polish Academy of Sciences in 76. Um, so the principal difference between this and what Reyes and Dion had already done in 73 was that they worked throughout in infinitary logic, L infinity omega, the language L infinity omega, which meant that they could handle not just coherent theories, as you now call them, but geometric theories, ones where you allow infinite disjunctions. And that meant that every growth and topos could be seen as a classifying topos or some geometric theory. So I think, I think that was the main contribution that Mihai Makai brought to the collaboration because he had already been working in infinitary logic before then. So, so that's the reason why they did it that way. Um, but uh, notice uh, in that book, everything is explicitly done over the category of sets. Um, there's, there's no attempt to talk about classifying toposes over a more general base, which we'd, as we've seen already occurred in the works of Shiro, Hakim and Gavin Rafe. Um, okay. Now, one question that I haven't actually been able to resolve is to what extent Andre Joao was involved in this um, development. Now, Gonzalo has, has written a, a paper published very recently, uh, although it's based on a talk given 20 years ago. Um, this quote, of all the results that Joao and I obtained in the 1970s, the most important and most widely quoted was the existence of the classifying topos of an arbitrary coherent theory. So that suggests that they did actually collaborate on that. And again, uh, in the Koch Reyes chapter in the Handbook of Mathematical Logic, um, they describe the syntactic side of construction of classifying toposes. They don't give proof, but they, they attribute it to Reyes in collaboration with Joao. It's a rather strange way of putting it when you think about it, um, but that's what they said. Um, so this suggests that Joao had a definite input to that. But I wonder whether he actually did. By the way, it's no use asking Joel because he's completely forgotten. I have asked him. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I, I question whether Joel was involved. And, um, you know, as far as I can remember, and I do have my notes of Bill Lovier's talks in 1973, Bill didn't say anything about Joel's involvement in that. Uh, his name didn't occur. In, it's uh, certainly not written down in my notes. And it's not in his, in the write up of his. July 73, Bristol talk, at least not in that context. He talked in that, in that lecture about other things that Joao had done, but not, not in connection with classifying toposes. And then the other uh, negative indication is that in the Mackay Reyes book, the only mention of Joao is in the, the preface. And all they say is, we would like to thank both Andre Joao and William Lauvier for many inspiring conversations. So no, that's gen just general thanks, uh, not specific input. And as far as I know, uh, that is that is the true state. So where there's this idea that Joao was involved in that construction, I don't know where, why it came from. However, Joao was involved in something else, a uh, different way of approaching classifying toposes. And I know about that uh, because again, I was, I was there when it was first exposed. This was at the Isle of Thorns open house in summer of 74. And that was the first time I met both Andre Joao and Monsignor Carlo Reyes. Uh, 
And they both gave talks on consecutive days about constructors of classifying top losses. Um, so again, quoting my diary from the time, uh, for me, Joel's talk was the high point of the whole conference. I, I was really bowled over by it. Uh, in comparison, I found Reyes's talk a little disappointing. And I think that was just because, you know, I'd already heard what he was talking about from Bill Dorvier the previous year. I mean, it was a good talk, and I, you know, uh, but, but I wasn't learning new things from it, whereas I was from Andre Joel. Um, so Joel started from the notion of an arithmetic universe, which, of course, he'd introduced the previous year at the Amiens conference. So you don't need to know what an arithmetic universe is, but it, essentially it encodes algebraic theories plus a certain amount of infantry structure so that you can do induction. And he'd shown that any finitely presented arithmetic universe has a classifying top loss. That's to say you can represent models of it by a particular top loss uh, just by an induction over the way it's presented. So that's the sort of algebraic part. And then if you want to add axioms that, that can't be expressed in the language of arithmetic universes, those just correspond to saying that you want certain monomorphisms in the classifying topos to be isomorphisms rather than just monomorphisms. And so what you need to do is to impose the smallest local operator, or the Viotini topology, if you want to call it that, for which those monomorphisms are dense. And then when you when you take sheets of that local operator, the, the, monomor the monos become isos, and so you've, you've done what you want. And incidentally, Joel also provided what I regard as an absolutely brilliant construction of how to how to force those topologies, how to force the monos to be ISOs. Um, so the phrase particularly elegant is the way I described it in my first book, and again in sketches for no effort. I just couldn't think of any other way to describe it. And he also showed that, you know, once you've got these classifying topologies, you can use them to construct at least certain exponentials in the in the two category of topologies and geometric morphisms. And of course, that was a subject that Andre and I later ex explored in more detail. But that's not really part of this talk. Okay, so now we move on to Miles Tierney. And Miles, uh, well, he had two papers in the Festschrift of Sammy Eilenberg. The first one was the, was the work that he talked about actually in that meeting in May 74. But then he had an afterthought. Um, and he described the connection between the two papers in this way. So when he wrote the first one, he already knew there was a strong connection between forcing topologies, which he'd used in it, and the existence of classifying top i, but due to time pressure, he wasn't able to prove that. But then a short time afterwards, he succeeded in constructing the classifying top os for a finitary geometric theory, or what we now call a coherent theory, over an arbitrary based top of natural numbers object. And he first talked about that and the absurdly simple construction of the spectrum of the ring top os that it gives in Bernabeu's seminar in Paris on 24th of May. And at the end of the paper, he added a note about how his result relates to Joyal's. Uh, so he first heard about Joyal's result from Julian Cole in May 75, not having been at the Isle of Thorns open house himself. And later in July, he spoke to Joyal in Amiens and learned that uh, Joyal had, had given a general construction of classifying top losses over the base top of sets, which had points in common with, with Tierney's and indeed uh, the, the use of forcing topologies was essentially the same idea. Uh, and that, that indeed is the case. Uh, the, the, but the main difference between Tierney's construction and trials is that Tierney worked explicitly over an arbitrary based on plus with natural numbers rather than over sets. So he began with race observation, which of course he had learnt from, from Gavin at the Amiens meeting in, in summer 73, that you can build an object classifier over any such dot plus. And from there, it's, it's straightforward. And again, this was something I did in my thesis in 74 uh, to build a classifier for diagrams of any finite shape. Once you've got a classifier for objects, you can build a classifier for morphisms. And then just by patching together copies of morphism classifiers, you can classify top of the diagrams or whatever shape you want. And then you can, you can consider a model of a coherent theory as being just a diagram of a particular finite shape in which certain parts of the diagram are forced to be limits or co-limits. Um, and again, you can force those things to happen by imposing the appropriate little via tierney local operator on the classifying topos for diagrams. Um, so that's just the same idea that Dondre Joyal had. Okay, so that construction was, was written up in the second of his two papers in the Eilenberg Festschrift 
which appeared in 1976, I think. Um, and he'd, he'd spoken about that in Paris in 1974, May 1970, sorry, May 1975. Um, and so now we come to the contribution of the two costs, uh, Michel and Marie Francoise. Marie Francoise later chose to be known by her maiden name of Marie Francoise Roy, or for a time she called herself Cost Roy, but at this time she was still using her husband's name. Um, and they wrote a joint paper on coherent theories and coherent toposes. It's dated May 1975, and I've got it here. Um, and it must have been remarkably quick work because, as they explain in the paper, it arose out of discussions from Miles Tierney, discussions with Miles Tierney after his talk in Benabou's seminar. Um, and as Tierney already told us, that talk was given on the 24th of May. So this paper must have been conceived, written, and typed up in the space of a single week. Um, and it is a remarkable document. Um, so it contains two separate constructions of classifying toposes for arbitrary coherent theories over sets. Um, and here's how they describe the relationship between them. So the, the, in the first chapter, they closely followed Reyes and Mackay and set up the co correspondence between coherent toposes and coherent theories. In the second chapter, they give a, a different construction of classifying toposes using sites that are easier to describe. And as I said, the idea of that construction arose out of discussions with Miles Tierney. Chapter zero, chapter zero is just a preliminary chapter set, setting up the logical machinery. Chapter zero and one were presented by Marie-Francoise in Benabou's seminar. And chapter two was presented by Michel in a seminar run by Miles Tierney in Paris. Chapter zero and two were written up by Michel, chapter one by Marie-Francoise, and the introduction was a compromise between the two authors. Um, so as stated, the, the construction in chapter one is essentially just the Mackay Reyes construction, but done for the finitary case of coherent theories. And the, the construction in chapter two is the new one. Um, so it, it is in, a, in some sense a development of Tierney's method, but it has the advantage of producing a much more explicit site of definition for the classifying topos. So it begins by just observing that any coherent theory, whatever, can obviously be presented as a quotient of an algebraic theory, T0. Um, I mean, you can just take the empty theory over the same signature as T, the theory with no axioms, that's certainly algebraic. But if you happen to have some algebraic axioms that are, that are present in T, you, you can throw them in. So for example, if you're looking at the theory of local rings, you can take your algebraic theory to be the theory of rings. Um, and the point about T0 is that we know that has a classifying topos, which is a pre sheaf topos. It, it's specifically covariant functors on finitely presented T, T0 models in sets. Uh, well, actually, they didn't, uh, in, in the paper, they described that classifying top, that pre sheaf topos in syntactic rather than semantic terms. But the equivalence between the two was, was already well known. I mean, it's part of Gabriel Ulmer duality, which goes back to 1971. Um, so you've got this explicit category of finitely presented T0 models. And then any geometric acts, well, I mean, they only did for the coherent case, but any geometric axiom you want to write down over that signature can just be understood as saying that a certain family of morphisms in this category of finitely presented T0 models uh, should, by the functor which corresponds to a model, be mapped to an epimorphic family. So in other words, you just want to take the Grotenik coverage on the opposite of T0 mod FP generated by those families and you get a site. Now, of course, uh, this uh, was to some extent inspired by, by Miles Tierney's talk on the 24th of May. It may also have been inspired by the fact that both Michel and Marie Francoise had been at the Isle of Thorns in 1974, so they'd heard Joël's talk. And I think it was also very likely inspired by knowing about Monique Hakim's work, because this is exactly the way that Monique Hakim constructed the classifying toposes for local rings and strictly local rings. She started with the classifying topos for rings and then worked out what sort of growth and topology you have to put on to get a classifier for those quotient theories. And indeed, the, the example they gave at the end of that, the cost gave at the end of this preprint was exactly the example of local rings, which they called l'exemple de, de Monique Hakim. Okay, so 
now I come back to the story. Um, I wasn't present in Paris at that time, but the, just a month later, there was a, another Oberhof category theory meeting, which I did go to. And there were three consecutive talks on the same day. I think it was the Tuesday of the week uh, by Miles Tierney, Jean Benabou, and Michel Tost, all talking about different constructions of flat iron processes. So I've told you about Tierney's and Costs already. Um, I haven't told you about Benabou's, so I now have to describe that. Oh, yes. So interest. And I, I just didn't say anything about cost talk. Um, well, I, I've told you, as I said, about the tyranny and cost constructions. Um, I need to tell you about the Bainable one. So this was based on his notion of corpus, which he'd introduced in a paper in the Contre Rendu of the Paris Academy. Building up to more and more complicated theories. But he had this abstract setting of the notion of corpus. So what is a corpus? It's a locally full sub two category of cat. So let's say it has some categories, some functors between them, but all natural transformations between those. And it has a, a, a list of closure conditions. And the important one is that you have representers, not just for objects, but for diagrams of any, I, I said any small shape, but I, I think there should be any finite shape. Um, so in other words, the functor from U to cat sending C to the functor category DC is representable by something that contains a generic diagram of that shape. And then the additional closure of properties on, on U allow you to construct classifiers for diagrams satisfying certain properties. And you know when you specialize to the case of toposes over, over a base or specialize to the case of rhythmic toposes, you get classifying toposes for arbitrary geometric theories. Uh, and if you specialize to toposes over a base, provided you've got a natural number object in the base, so you've got an object classifier, uh, you can do at least finitely presented geometric theories. Okay. Uh, the next strand of the development starts with a famous unpublished paper of Julian Cole, um, which I think he wrote in late 74 or early 75, on, uh, called the bicatry of Topoi and Spectra. Um, this was very widely circulated at the time, but he never bothered to publish it. It finally appeared in 2016 as a TAC reprint, which I've been printed before. Um, and uh, it's a remarkable paper. Uh, so he explicitly took the view that every growth and topos classifies something, uh, which of course he learned, having been at the Isle of Thorns in 74, he learned that from uh, Royal and Reyes, as I did. Um, and what he was concerned with was, was the contractor spectra. Now, of course, we had a talk about spectra earlier today. Um, and uh, so he, he had this idea that the general notion of spectrum was that of an adjoint to a forgetful functor between two categories of top losses equipped with appropriate models. So, so the, the case that Hakim had studied was top, ring top losses and locally ring top losses. And he observed that you could do this in much more generality. Um, and the key thing about this was that he explicitly used the, the notions of bicategorical limits that you have in, in toposes and geometric morphisms uh, just to turn this all in, into a piece of two category theory. Um, and I picked up that idea in a talk I gave you know, in a meeting at Louvain-la-Neuve in May 1977. Um, and I showed that you know if, if, you, if you want to build classifying toposes, um, all you need is an object classifier, and then everything else follows from the fact that uh, the top over E has the, the appropriate weighted pseudo limits uh, that, that you need to, to build the rest of it. Um, so uh, as I say, I, I was essentially following Julian's lead in that because Julian had that idea that this was all really just weighted limits in, two cat in, a, in the two category of top losses. Um, and Julian did write a paper about classifying toposes, which was published in a very obscure East German publication in 1979. And for a long time, I believed that he had actually done the same construction there, but he didn't. Um, I, I finally managed to track down a copy of that, uh, and he used the, the Reyes Dion method. Um, but I'm sure he knew that that you could do this. So, so I, I don't really claim original credit for having shown that the whole thing, apart from the object classifier, was uh, was just two categorical weighted limits because Julian certainly knew that, but he didn't write it up that way. Okay, so 
um, let's summarize where we've got to. Um, really, the, you know, there are multi multiplicity of different constructions, but there are three, three main types. So the first one is the syntactic site construction as pioneered by Reyes and Dion and also written up in greater detail uh, by Reyes and Mackay. Um, and this certainly is the most canonical way of constructing a classifying topos because you just proceed directly from the syntax of the theory to the construction of the site. There are no arbitrary choices involved. And it also offers the simplest possible proof of the conservativity of the generic model, the fact that the only geometric sequence it satisfies are the ones that you can actually prove in the theory. Um, because since it's built out of the syntax, what you think it satisfies are, are those, those things which are syntactically provable. And it always provides a subcanonical site, let's say one where the representable functors are sheaves, and that's an advantage. Then there are the step-by-step -step constructions. So I, I class together Joel, Tierney, and Danabu in this, um, and also my own uh, purely two categorical development of that. So these, these really give the most conceptual proofs of why classifying topologies exist. If you just want to show they exist, this is surely the way to do it. Um, uh, but of course, the price you pay is that you end up with a very abstract description of the topos. It's very hard to get an explicit site of definition for the classifying topos out of it. So if you actually want to calculate anything about the generic model of a theory, um, that's not the way to do it. And then the third construction is the two-step construction due to Michel Cost, where you start with the classifying for an algebraic theory and then impose your extra axioms. Uh, and that has the great advantage that its underlying category of the site is completely explicit and concrete. It's just finitely presented T0 models in sets. And again, the covers, they do arise directly from the axioms of the theory. You don't have to make any arbitrary choices about them. Um, and so this is the construction that makes it easiest to calculate non-geometric properties of a generic model. So for example, um, I, I quoted the first, first such example is probably Alice Cox's proof that the generic local rings satisfy a certain field axiom, which allows you to develop a, a, a synthetic projective geometry over the arbitrary local rings. And of course, later he, he showed that not only did it have that first order property, that non-geometric first order property, but it also has the higher order property of the clock rule here axiom, the synthetic differential geometry. And both of those, well, of course, uh, Monica Hakim had already given that construction of the generic local ring, but, but as I say, that was a specific case of Michel Coste's construction. Um, and the downside as compared with the syntactic height construction is that it's not completely canonical, which you've got to choose your theory T0. And if you make a bad choice, you'll, you'll very likely end up with a site that isn't subcanonical. So the description of the generic model is less explicit than you would like. Uh, but if you're careful, you, you, you can usually get one that's subcanonical. Okay, so we got these three techniques and each of them has advantages and disadvantages. And so really you, you need all three of them. And uh, you know, in what I'm going to say about Olivia Caramello's uh, duality theorem, you, you'll, you'll see the point of that, I hope because each of them has its uses and, and so you, 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 don't, you shouldn't throw any of them away. Now, just briefly, um, I'll list the, the, the various book form publications where you can find these results. Uh, so as I've already said, the first book form publication of, of classifying toposes occurred in the Mokai Reyes book. Um, and of course they gave pride of, pride of place to the syntactic site construction, but they did actually also include costs method in a section at the end, and they, they actually described it as a better way than their own construction, which I thought was nice of them. Uh, in my first top of theory book, I used Tierney's construction. Uh, on the other hand, my, uh, Saunders, McLean, and Deacon Wardyke in their top of theory book, they used as, only the syntactic site construction. I should mention the book by Barr and Wells, Topos's Triples and Theories, because they construct what they call classifying topos's but it was done entirely in terms of sketches and they didn't connect that to the idea of syntactically presented theory, well, at least not explicitly. So that doesn't really fit into this, this story properly, but I, I thought I should mention it in case anyone asked. Uh, Francis Bosseur, in, his, in the third volume of his handbook of categorical algebra, also gave a construction using sketches, but it's actually essentially the same as Michel Coste's. 
um, and in Sketches of an Elephant, I finally wrote up that purely two categorical version of the step-by-step -step construction in one section, and then in, in another section, I gave both the syntactic site construction and the cost construction. Uh, and I put them side by side deliberately because I wanted people to know they're both there and they're both available. And finally, in, in Olivia Caramello's book, she just gives the syntactic site construction. Right, well, I have 10 minutes left to say something about uh, Olivia Caramello's duality theorem. Um, so this, I mean, it appears in her PhD thesis and also in her book. And so what it says is that for any geometric theory, there's a bijective correspondence between subtoposes of the classifying topos for T and equivalence classes of geometric quotients of T, let's say theories obtained from T by adding more axioms, but no more sorts or uh, primitive symbols. Okay, so what about this? Well, is it a theorem? And is it due to Caramello? Um, well, notice it's completely easy to see using either the syntactic site construction or the cost construction, that if you've got a site and you add more, if you've got the site for, for set T and you add more covers to it, those are just going to correspond to extra geometric axioms in the language of T. So you're going to get a classifier for a geometric quotient of T. On the other hand, if you use the syntactic site construction, it's not obvious that every quotient of T is classified by a subtopos of set T. And the reason is that when you add more axioms to your theory, you don't just change the coverage on the site, you change the underlying category. And actually, of course, it's essential that you should do that in the syntactic site construct presentation, because you know that's always going to give a subcanonical site, whereas if you add more covers to a site, you have you, you, you tend to destroy subcanonicity. Um, so if you take that point of view, it's not obvious that every quotient gives rise to a subtopos. But if you take cost construction, it's completely obvious because you've already expressed T as a quotient of an algebraic theory T0. Adding more axioms just gives you a smaller quotient of T0, so it gives you, a, gives you more covers in your site. Okay, so as I've already said, Caramello used only the syntactic site construction of classifying topos in her book, and therefore the proof of the duality theorem. It does look like a theorem, it occupies over four pages, uh, and it's not completely obvious. But as I say, if you use the cost construction, it is obvious. Okay, well, Caramello clearly believes that this is an important theorem, and she's right about that, uh, but she also believes that she deserves credit as its discoverer. And she's persuaded quite a lot of people that, that, that she deserves that credit. And I just wanted to mention Laura Laforgue, uh, who has championed her cause in various places. The trouble is Laforgue doesn't know the history of Topos theory. Um, so uh, I had an email correspondence with him back in 2015 about this. And, you know, he, he, is, he was absolutely insistent that even if something is a folk theorem, that it was known to people but not written down before, full credit deserve, belongs to the person who first published it. And he then backed this up by giving the example of the Yoneda dilemma. And so what he said is, an extreme example is the Yoneda dilemma, certainly the most fundamental result in category theory. And the fact that the proof of this lemma might be trivial doesn't mean that the lemma was well known before the Yoneda or that Yoneda doesn't deserve to have the credit when it's quoted. Um, but that was based on the assumption that Yoneda actually published the Yoneda lemma. And as I hope everyone here knows, he didn't. It, it got the name Yoneda lemma because Saunders McLean learned it from Yoneda. And there's, there's a well-known story about uh, the conversation with two men in, in the Gare du Nord in Paris while one of them was waiting for a train. Uh, but Yoneda himself never bothered to write it up. It was, Yoneda, it was McLean who saw its importance and because he kept referring to it as Yoneda's lemma, that's how it got the name. Um, well, that's by the way. Um, but there is an obvious question. The duality theorem is certainly true and it is useful. Why did no one publish it before Caramello? Um, well, I've said that, you know, the, there are three, there are actually three ingredients. I've talked about two of them, that is from subtoposes to quotients and quotients to subtoposes. But of course, you also need the fact that those two are inverse to each other. Now, the first two are completely obvious if you use if you use the Michel Cost construction. Um, the fact that they're inverse to each other, the key thing there is showing that if you have two quotient theories that give rise to the same subtopos, they're equivalent. And for that, you need the conservativity of the generic model. Um, because if, if they give rise to the same subtopos, they have the same generic models, 
so they satisfy the, the genetic model satisfy the same sequence. Um, and that, as I said, you know, just falls out of the syntactic site construction, absolutely free. It's not obvious with cost construction. Um, so that's an excellent example of why you do need more than one construction. The passage back and forth is easy with cost. Um, the conservativity of the generic model is easy with the syntactic site construction. Putting them together, um, you get the results. So anyone could have put them together any time from 1977 onwards, because they were all in the literature by then. No one did. Um, so why not? Well, I think basically the reason is that most people would have considered it just as a trivial corollary, not a theorem of its own right, a corollary of the existence of classifying toposes, so not worth publishing on its own. And I think there's an analogy between the relationship between the big and little Giro theorems. So the little Giro theorem characterizes subtoposes of appreciative topos in terms of growth elite topologies on, on the category. The big Giro theorem classifies characterizes all Jimmy toposes in terms of exactness properties. Once you've got the big Giro theorem, the little Giro theorem is essentially a trivial corollary. Oh, they, they did in fact come the other way around in that case. Um, and once you've got the existence of classifying toposes, the duality theorem of, of Caramella is a trivial corollary. But although no one published the result, there's plenty of evidence that people knew it. And I just wanted to mention a few. So the first is a paper by the costs uh, which appeared in 1979 in the proceedings of the 1978 Aarhus Open House, uh, where they, they studied this question of when the geometric quotient of the theory of rings has a generic model which satisfies the cock volvere axiom. And they pr produced a complete answer. Uh, it's, it, it, it's equivalent to a semantic property of the, of the corresponding quotient theory, which they called epsilon stability. And the point is, they, they knew perfectly well that you have this bijection between quotients of the theory of rings and subtopics of the ring classifier. It was so obvious that they just didn't need to state it. And again, another example, you do Eduardo Dubuc, who constructed what I think was the first well-adapted model of synthetic differential geometry by taking the classifier, well, by taking an appropriate coverage on the dual of finitely presented C infinity rings. And that coverage contains as a risky coverage, so it defines a subtopos of the classifier for local C-infinity rings. He knew that had to be a quotient of the theory of local C-infinity rings, and he identified the extra axiom you need, which is an Archimedean axiom. Um, yeah. Then perhaps the most remarkable example of all is one that uh, Gavin Race uh, came up with back in 1973. So I already, he already told me about this in Bangor in, 19, in September 73. And we wrote it up in our joint paper in 78. Um, of course, once you've shown that there is an object classifier over any top topos with natural number object, uh, there's an obvious question whether a natural number object is really necessary. That question was finally answered uh, affirmatively by and Andreas Blas in 79. But already, as I say, by 1973, Gavin had come up with a proof that you can't have an object classifier over the topos of finite sets. And although we didn't quite present it this way, the basic idea was that if you want a topos defined over finite sets, um, it has finite home sets, so it has only finitely many or the attorney topologies, and therefore finitely many subtoposes. But it's dead easy to write down infinitely many quotients for the theory of objects, which are an equivalent, even when you look at their models in finite sets. Just take for every n the theory of sets with at most n elements, which you can express as a coherent theory. Um, so you can't have a bijection between quotients of that theory and subtoposes of classifying topos. And just for good measure, I should mention the one joint paper I wrote with Olivia when she was my PhD student. So she'd come up with this lovely notion of demorganization. And uh, I suggested we should look at what you get by demorganizing the, the, the classifying topos for fields, which is about the first example you come across where the classifying topos isn't already demorgan. And we, we came up with a explicit presentation of that quotient theory. And for good measure, we did the Booleanization as well. And incidentally, we used uh, cost method to construct the field classifier there. So Olivia can't claim that she didn't know it. OK. Um, so none of the, the authors of those papers felt any need to state the duality theorem explicitly. But it's absolutely clear that they knew it. I'm going to skip over the next three slides um, and just say, what conclusions can we draw from the history of this development? Um, well, we've seen that we've got a well-stocked toolkit of 
techniques for handling geometric fields in the glass-like hypothesis. And I think it's important to realize that the way we arrived at this, you know, it wasn't a linear process. It was a not, you know, it, it, it depended crucially on encounters between the principal players at, at international meetings. Um, so Michel Koss's construction, you know, probably the most significant in terms of potential applications, but it didn't come from nowhere. It came from, in the first place, discussions between Koss and Tierney in Paris in May 75, but also from the fact that Koss had heard Joel's talk in 74 and that he'd read Hacking's book. And Tierney, of course, was in, in turn inspired by having heard Rafe's lecture on the object classifier in Amiens in 73. Rafe made use of Diaconescu's work, and Diaconescu, as I said, probably due in inspiration for Giraud's work. So all these things, they, they interact. And, uh, you know, it, a lot of those interactions took place at international conferences. So it, this is a really powerful reminder of how important it is that we have international meetings like this to, to enable ideas to, to flourish and germinate. And so we, we should all be profoundly thankful that we are at last beginning to get back to international meetings. And you know, this, this isn't standard. Normally one would have a round of applause for the organizers of the conference at the end of a meeting. I shan't be here at the end of the meeting, but I would like just to have a finish with a round of applause for the organizers of this meeting for the incredible perseverance they've shown in actually making it happen and making it happen as an in-person meeting. So please join me in, in applauding all the organizers. <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter, for this very interesting talk. I guess there will be questions or comments here in the room. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, it was really nice seeing uh, all this in the historical perspective. Uh, but my question isn't uh, that historical, or rather, mm -hmm. I would like to know uh how this relates or rather how uh elementary topos uh, relates to uh, the notion of uh, a classifying topos is this only uh something Sorry? Um, yeah I, I mean um from what i understood uh, this is all about grotendic topos mm -hmm. and i was wondering whether uh classifying uh elementary topos classify something uh, just like growing the positive. Well, not not in the abstract, but but topos is over a given elementary topos. Okay. Uh, you, you know, the the two the two category of arbitrary elementary topos is 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 just not complete enough to to have any sort of sensible notion of representable functor on it. You have to you have to localize over a particular base topos, but that base topos can be elementary. Okay, I see. Uh, I don't know if I, I uh, am asking another question possible. Hmm? Uh, you mentioned forcing topologies. I would like to know if there was a connection with uh, forcing and uh, set theory and how. Oh, of course, yes. That, force... That's why the name was used. Yeah, I, I guess because I, I know there's a link between forcing mm. and simplification. Mm. Uh, and I was wondering how this uh, comes into place in your, uh, uh, your, your story. Well, of course, if, if I had more time, I might have yeah, talked a okay. bit about yeah. um, the topos theoretic proofs independence proofs in set theory where, you know, the, the forcing construction of set theory does appear precisely as a forcing topology, mm -hmm. because what you're doing is you're, you're building a classifying topos for a suitable theory. I see. Thank you very much. Any other question here? So this was a very exciting talk, but you skipped one slide, namely the last but one. Sorry? You skipped one slide. I, I skipped one page because I'm, I, I, I'm not Can happy about it. it. <laughs> yes. Um, but, uh, no, there, there is a rather disagreeable paper written by um, a gentleman called Ritberg, Tanswell, and Van Bendegem, in which they they discuss 
Olivia Caramello's claim to the originality of uh, 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 duality theorem and, and well I don't want to go into the details uh, yes yes two of them are from Brussels I think there is a question from Paul Cader uh, online hello Paul hello um, hello Peter um, uh, thanks for a very interesting talk so I was also going to ask about the FET theory and what might have been achieved if the set series had been more cooperative. Um, I was also going to ask you a personal question that your diary that you mentioned, um, would it be suitable for editing as a, as a history of category theory or would it be too embarrassing for your film? No, no, it's far too personal. Yeah, right, okay. <laughs> uh, selected quotes are okay, but I'm not going to make the text available to anyone. You want to say more about the set about what might have been achieved with set theory? Um, I don't think it's helpful at this stage. No. So is, it seems there is a question from Steve Alday. Hi, Peter. Hi, Steve. Thanks for the talk. Sorry, I can't be there. Um, I wonder if you want to mention anything about a different approach to classifying topos coming out of the work of Joy Allen Tierney and then later Ike Mordike of representing toposes as equivariant sheaves on a localic or topological groupoid. Mm -hmm. It gives the presentation of the classifying topos as equivariant sheaves on the groupoid of models, which I think is a beautiful idea as well. Um, it little, is. But it, uh, you know, it, it didn't fit into the context of this talk. Exactly. It didn't fit into the talk, yeah. If I had infinite amounts of time, that would have been one thing I would have talked about. But right. I don't. Okay. So thank you. Thanks. And now it's time for Millie. This time you can ask your question. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, Peter, uh, I would like to ask you whether um, it's possible to uh, get uh, notes from uh, the talks about uh, Joya, by Joyal about the arithmetic universes uh, connected to classifying toposes, uh, if uh, there is anything written down. Um, yes, well, um, I have my notes of Joyal's talk in the Isle of Thorns in 1974. Huh? I did uh, some time ago make a uh, a scan of them and send it to Steve Vicker because he was very interested. Yeah. I could send that to you. I mean, not from here, but once I'm home, if you if you want to see it. But of course, Joel himself had nothing written up, and when I told him about it, he'd forgotten all about that talk. It's a pity that we cannot have also these notes uh, available for um, like uh, without uh, any. Um, possibility to go on uh, and uh, I also claim uh, the um, of the uh, the idea. Uh, so this is a possibility to make public public also notes. Yes, I would yeah. say. Thank you very much, Walter Tolan. Yes, yes, I. Peter, thank you for, for your wonderful uh, talk. I just uh, wanted to add to your last comments. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, for me, having been also part of these uh, conferences uh, in the 1970s, mid 1970s, just wanted to emphasize the atmosphere at these meetings mm -hmm. they had a level of intensity and the excitement that uh, was, in my view, unprecedented. And uh, it's very nice that you brought back uh, the memories. And in okay. particular, I think it is important what we see, Peter's ability to keep notes and having this um, incredible uh, archive <laughs> of, of the events uh, that, that took place uh, at that time. And uh, I would also say uh, history of math is complicated. It's a very complicated subject. It is. And I wanted to thank you specifically for your 
contribution to this today. Thank you. Thank you. So I think it's time to thank Peter again for this beautiful talk. So thank you very much for this historical overview. This, for me, it's, it's very, very useful because I was not there and I'm not mm -hmm. in the field. And, and I appreciate that very much. I feel I should say something about this thing with Caramelo, though, because mm -hmm. I mean, just because it's a woman and I happen to be a woman and it's not her fault and it's not mine either. Um, I think so let me just say that <clears throat> I have never thought of myself as a woman, just as a mathematician. Mm. But I do realize over time that it's much harder to have an opinion or have even a view or anything. I don't know if other mm. women share this, but this is this is my experience. And so I what I have seen in younger women is like most of them are just to me. And you don't even notice that they know anything. A few like then make the mistake on the other side, okay, and are too obnoxious. Uh, there are definitely plenty of obnoxious mathematicians, uh, <laughs> and, um, yeah. and we don't notice it so much as men. And I feel like, no. uh, in my opinion. Uh, Olivia Caramello has many faults in the way she presents things and often presents things I find somewhat trivial as though it's some panacea, but, but I think she's doing very good work and she's working very hard and she's very, and she is smart oh, yes, and she yes. can get somewhere, right? So no, I, I, I think we need to cut her a little bit of slack just because it's not a good atmosphere this is my opinion. Okay? No, I, 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 I'm entirely with you. You know, okay. Olivia is, is along with Andy Pitts. She's one of the two brightest students I ever had, mm -hmm. and I have great admiration for her work. But, okay, well, that's really uh, great to hear. I think. Um, uh, but I, you know, I, I can't allow, um, and and this this has nothing to do with her being a woman. I, you know, I, I can't allow her to claim credit for things that. No, no, I'm just saying credit. that that. The fact that I have the feeling that this adds to this problem of having a hard time mm. how to say things. Well, I, okay? yes, I, I hope so it I'm doesn't. I'm not saying I, it has something mm. to do with what you are doing, but maybe with what mm. she's doing. Yeah. Okay, but let's leave that out then, because I'm not an expert in being a woman. So I don't know. <laughs> but, um, mm. but I just wanted to say that I think that I would love if we would just forget about that. Uh, so would okay? I, yeah. Because mm. it's, we just hear about this vibrant history and how wonderful mm. the atmosphere was. And this kind of thing to me mm. is not a good atmosphere. Well, yes, I mean, there were rows that I didn't talk about. There was a monumental <laughs> row that I had with Jean Benabou in yes, over Vafa 75, that I, yes. I left that. <laughs> and and uh, just one more thing. Um, for students and for people outside the field, uh, if I understand what you just told us, you kind of need the two constructions, right? Yeah. Uh, in order to see that this theorem mm. is is uh, trivial, well, right? Because the the one mm. direction is trivial on one side, and the other is yeah. trivial on the other side. So you, so her duality theorem is equivalent to the equivalent. <laughs> of the two ways of seeing it, yeah. Um, well, you know, both uh, you know, the equivalence of the two ways is is automatic because, you know, any two representing objects for the same functor are, are isomorphic. Okay. So. Um, okay. But, well, yeah, anyway, so it's the existence I, of the two constructions which is important. It, is a, it doesn't mean that it's not worth presenting it like this. I agree. I, I agree. It, 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 it is mean, worth presenting, but yeah. it it, it okay. shouldn't be called a theorem. It should be called a corollary. Okay. I think I've said more than enough. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much.